This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. There is no more respected name in polling and research than George Barna. Almost any stat quoted in church or on faith-based media regarding the worldview of Christians is a direct quote from the Barna Group. I'm honored today to be joined from California by Dr. Barna. We're going to discuss the latest research showing what Christians really believe. And I'll also ask his opinion on how much we should trust those political polls we see all the time on the news. First, I want to find the story behind Barna Research. Uh, when did you first begin uh, researching the American Christian culture? Well, I started that probably back in the mid-1980s. Mm -hmm. And, of course, over the course of time, began to understand more and more about what was going on. Didn't really grasp the importance of worldview until the 1990s and started evaluating that around the mid-1990s. What, what, what do you think has changed the most in, in both the American culture and the American church in that time that you've been looking at it and, and, and analyzing it? I think maybe the biggest change in the culture has been its rejection of absolute moral truth. And I would say the biggest change in the church has been that it's been willing to accommodate the culture. Uh, these days, I would say that the church is being changed more by the culture than the culture is being changed by the church. Now, we, we've always thought of this, this country as being a Christian country, that we're, we're Christian, we were founded on Christian values, that we're a Christian country. but. That is changing rapidly. Even President Barack Obama said that we're no longer a Christian nation. But uh, in 1996 or the middle of the 90s, when you were looking at worldview, what's changed since then? How, how far have we fallen? Well, if you think about what goes into a worldview, it's, it's the accumulation of all of your most important beliefs. And if we look at some of the most important beliefs about God, about the Bible, about truth, about... Uh, humanity, about the purpose of life, about success and how you define it in life, about morality. If we were to take each of those, which we do in this inventory, and start to dissect them and try to figure out where do we stand today, what we would understand is that we've changed radically in each of those domains. So, for instance, simply believing in the God described in the Bible. Back in the mid-1990s, you had about three out of four people who said that God is the all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the universe, still rules it today. Today, that's dropped down to just half of Americans. Wow. And so that's just an, a simple indicator of the dramatic shift that we've seen take place in what historically would be considered a very short period of time. Well, in this, in this latest project with the, the, the American Worldview Inventory, uh, one of the things it says here, Americans overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly believe that life has a sp specific purpose. They're just not sure what it is. That, uh, <laughs> even Christians that would say, yes, I'm a Christian. I go to church every, day, every Sunday. I tithe. I do what's necessary as a Christian, supposedly. really doesn't know what the purpose of their life is. I mean, in America today, what we find is that the vast majority of people stumble around in terms of how they would identify the purpose of life. Ultimately, the most common answer has something to do with their own personal happiness, their personal fulfillment, as opposed to uh, understanding, knowing, loving, obeying God, something about that relationship mm -hmm. with God. That's what you would find in a Christian culture, but we don't find that in American culture. And other, speaking of American culture, other cultures, uh, how, do you, how, how would you compare the United States Christian culture to that of other Western cultures? Uh, is it, I mean, a lot of those have declined. I lived in England for a while. We had a tough time finding a church in England that hadn't been turned over to an antique shop or something like that. At that time, they were saying we were about 10 years behind the decline in France and the decline in, in England. Where are we now compared to other Western cultures? Yeah, in order to answer that, Bob, I'd have to do research in those mm -hmm. other cultures, which I, I haven't. So I don't know. But some of the guys I know in those other countries who do that research have shared that with me. And it's the same type of thing that you're saying, mm -hmm. although I don't believe we're 10 years behind those cultures in terms of rejecting Christianity. I think we're rejecting it in different ways. I think we're more sophisticated in some ways in our rejection, but, but rapidly we're moving away from a biblical perspective 
on how life operates and embracing a more secular perspective. So do most, most people have a worldview and they just don't know what it is? Or is their worldview the latest YouTube video they watch and they're living vicariously through that? Yeah, everybody has a worldview. And, and one mm -hmm. of the important things to understand about it is that a person's worldview begins developing somewhere between 15 to 18 months of age and 13 years of age. By 13 years old, a person's worldview is pretty much formed for the rest of their life. During the teens and the 20s, we reshape it, re we redefine it somehow, we figure out how to articulate it, how to implement it, but it's really developed in those first 13 years of life. You need a worldview to get through the day because it's essentially the operating system for a human being. Yeah. It's the thing that helps us to make our decisions in every situation we find ourselves in. So yeah, everybody has a worldview, but there are a lot of different worldviews you can choose from. And what I've found after doing this kind of research now for more than 25 years, I have yet to find my first person that I've interviewed. I've interviewed tens of thousands of people about this who has a pure worldview, no matter which one it is, whether it's Marxism, secular humanism, uh, a new age worldview, Eastern mysticism, biblical worldview, I haven't found anybody that has a pure worldview. So what we do is we cut and paste elements mm -hmm. of all these different worldviews that we're exposed to through the media, through the schools, through government policies, through family conversations, and we create a worldview that feels comfortable to us. And Right now you're t talking about the worldview being settled by the time they're 13 years old and you've got uh, every child I know in front of a television set or in front of a game playing games and, or, or on the internet watching YouTube or TikTok or whatever that is. How much does that go into forming their worldview? I mean, they're, they're outside their home. They may, I mean, they're, they're, their mind is 45,000 miles away be, but they're inside their home at the time, but their mind is outside. What's forming that worldview in, in, in them? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. A few years back, I'd done some research trying to figure out what influences what we think and do. Mm -hmm. And what I discovered was yeah. with children during that formative period of time, it's predominantly media, schools, government policies, and family interaction. In that Those order? In that order? Uh, not, not necessarily okay. in that order, but certainly media, the arts and entertainment media have dramatically more influence than the other three combined. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a huge influence. And that's, that's tough to get, uh, to get that influence away from most teenagers, most uh, preteens that I've seen. It's tough to get them out from in front of it. Well, sure. And, you know, it's interesting because there had been a book that came out a few years ago where the fellow claimed that somebody who becomes an expert in something will spend 10,000 hours practicing it. And what we know is that with the typical 18-year-old in America today, they will have been exposed to about 32,000 hours of media content. And yeah. so you look at that dramatic mm -hmm. body of information that they've been exposed to, it's going to leave a lasting imprint. Yeah, and now we're, I mean, the, the media impact now, I mean, we listen to where, where are we getting our news from? Where are we getting facts from uh, concerning what's going on in not only the United States, but in the world? But uh, the media we're watching seems to have an agenda. Uh, are, we, are we, where do we find something we can trust? That's a tough one. Uh, you know, I, I've been doing a lot of research in uh, uh, the political and government arena over the last few years. One of the things I discovered is that Christians in particular, devoted Christians, are very upset about the fact that they're not getting objective reporting. Everything seems to have an agenda. Yeah. It's become subjective journalism. And so they've been searching for new sources of information that they feel will give them a better sense of what's really going on. And that's so important, Bob, because keep in mind that most of the things that we have an opinion about, most of the things that we think we know, we haven't personally experienced. There are things that True. were given to us by the media, things that were described to us by these people that have a very different agenda. And so before you know it, without even realizing it, subconsciously almost, we've adopted their agenda. Yeah, I'm amazed by, by people that I talk to that maybe left wing or right wing and the media they're listening to that's all they all they know i mean i was talking to a guy the other day who had no idea who antifa was i'm thinking who are you listening to on the news 
and then I found out, and they're, they're not talking about Antifa, they're talking about something else. But it, yeah. it does, we, we do go to that side that we, that we think that, that we're going to get the, uh, the right answers from. Yeah, it's interesting because we shape our environment, but then that environment mm -hmm. shapes us in return. So we have to be very careful about what we let in there. What, what, what do you, th when you're looking at, we're in an election year, 2020, what are you looking at, and when you look at the polls, and I've seen a few, and I think that's got to be skewed. That has got to, I saw one poll where they admitted that, uh, that they were polling and only 15% of the people they were polling were coming from one political persuasion. Everybody else was either non-persuaded or coming from the other side. And they were getting these results and they were publishing the results as if they were facts. And, and uh, what do you think about the polls today? Are they really showing us what people think? Or are they trying to guide us to what we should think? Well, it depends on which ones you're talking about. I mean, <laughs> there are some polls that I trust, not mm -hmm. many, but, but there are a few. But even I look at a lot of the media polls, for instance, that we hear about in the news. And when I start to look at their questionnaire, when I look at their sampling process, when I look at some of the ways they've analyzed the data, you can identify the intentional skew that's in that reporting. And so, you know, can polls be effective? Can they be objective? Absolutely, the good ones are. But now what's happened is everything has become so politicized that certain parties or ideologies or groups are using polls as a means of persuading the public because we know from research that people like to side with a winner. Yeah. So they don't want conflict in their life. They don't want conflict in their relationships. And so they're trying to figure out what's everybody else doing. And so if you can skew that public opinion polling, you're not going to win over a huge amount of people, but you'll probably win over enough to win a close election. Yeah, I want to ask you about that. When you say people want to be on the side of the winner and they want to they kind of go that way. With the uh, what they call a cancel culture today, I mean, if you don't agree with the people around you, they don't agree that they're going to call you boss and get you fired or something. But that, I mean, that it, you, you, you know, your opinion no longer counts because you don't agree with this poll result or this group of people. Well, and, and that brings up something interesting, Bob, because one of the things that I'm sensing, I don't have the data on this yet, we're working on it, is that a lot of people, because of the danger to be very honest and vulnerable mm -hmm. about what you believe, in this kind of cancel culture, some individuals, it appears, in polls are not willing to be honest with what they really believe because they don't know who's doing the polling, what is behind the polling, what's going to happen with that data, whether or not it's going to come back to bite them. So I mean, there's even a, a whole new twist that we as, as professional researchers have to be sensitive to in terms of how we're measuring information how we're putting people at ease to be able to be honest in surveys that, that, that's interesting because i've gotten a couple of telephone calls that were polls and my wife said don't answer anything <laughs> they may well, they may have your name they've got your phone number don't answer well and, and that's true and some of them do they're what are known as push polls mm -hmm. and the idea is that they're trying to push you to believe certain things either by the way the question is asked or the kind of positive feedback that you get when you give certain answers. Mm -hmm. Good surveys don't do any of that, but that's being done all the time. In a moment, I want to dive deeper into how the research assists church leaders in better communicating with their members. That's in just a minute. But next week, I'll be joined by a former businessman who believes he received a vision to share future events based on the book of Revelation. Rick Pearson is a Canadian who believes America is playing a major role in prophecy. You may be surprised what he thinks could be next for our nation. That's on next week's Viewpoint. As the climate in our world grows more hostile toward our Christian worldview, Viewpoint is a program designed to help defend our faith. Each week, Bob Placey interviews guests who bring the Bible into focus. And we can be salt and light in this culture. Every description of Babylon in this book is going to come to pass. Helping us understand how relevant God's Word is for today. Viewpoint is completely viewer supported. If you've enjoyed and benefited from our interviews, we would ask you to consider helping us by supporting it financially. Your 20, 50, or even $100 monthly gift will help us continue to bring you more of these programs. 
Go to WTLW.com now and click Get Involved, or you can send a check to the address on your screen. Thank you for supporting Viewpoint. Well, do you think the, the polls that you're conducting, the research that you're, that you're publishing, uh, is it having a positive effect on the church? I mean, is it, is it for them to see the reality of where they are, do you, do you get feedback that it's having a positive effect in the, in, in the church? Here's the difficulty, Bob. I mean, we studied with church leaders, senior pastors of churches across mm -hmm. the country, we asked them, do you think your church is successful in ministry? Is it effective in ministry? More than four out of five said, absolutely. We said, okay, great. So how do you know that? What is it that you look at to determine that you're mm -hmm. effective in ministry? And we found that there were five things that were consistently being measured across the country. How many people show up? How much money is raised? How many programs are offered? How many staff people have been hired? And how much square footage has been built out on the campus? Now, Remember, I'm a measurement yeah. guy, so I'm glad that they're measuring things. But in our industry, we have an expression, you get what you measure. And so mm -hmm. you've got to be measuring the right stuff. Jesus didn't die for any of those five indicators. you know. And what those mm -hmm. five indicators basically do is they say, if you want to be successful, attract as many people as you can, tell them things that aren't going to be controversial or confrontational, and help them if you can but without being controversial or confrontational. So, you know, is the kind of research that I'm doing having a dramatic impact on churches? No, they don't want to hear this because it conflicts with those measures of success. Yeah. Because what I would say is, you know what? You've got to help people know God's truth. People aren't necessarily going to like it, but God gave it to us for their best interests. It's beneficial to people to follow the path that God has laid out for us. But sometimes that's going to make some people walk away. Yeah, a little later on, I want to ask you about what, what you think the, the church's response should be, what they should be doing in those churches to, to grab a hold of some of those, those hearts there. But first, I want, to, I want to ask you about uh, when we see the current unrest in this country, when we see what's going on, the push for anarchy and some of the, some of the things that we see in the secular worldview, uh, where do you think it, it really is I mean, is this a, this a blip in the radar, or is this a trend that, that really is taking us someplace? No, th this is definitely an entrenched trend. And the reason I say that is because as I study generations and look at change from generation to generation, what we're finding is with the youngest two generations, they have definitely moved ideologically more to the left, if you will. They're much more comfortable with Marxist thought. They're much more comfortable with socialist government, and they're really illiterate when it comes to biblical theology. And so when you put all of that together, basically what it says is they're going to be doing whatever they do for their best personal interests and feelings. They're going to do what they think is going to give them the kind of life that they ideally want. It may not be biblical, but it's what they're after. And they're going to be doing that throughout the rest of their life because their worldview is pretty well settled at that point. Are they also, are they also uh, uneducated or ignorant of, of what true Marxism is? Or does it just seem that attractive to them that, that the United States can adopt this without going the way of Venezuela or, or, or Cuba or Russia or something like that? First of all, we know that they have no idea what countries in the world have tried mm -hmm. socialism which countries have adopted Marxism. They're unable to identify the core tenets of Marxism. What they know is that, boy, if you have a Marxist government, they're going to take care of you. You don't have to work as hard. You know, your, your health insurance is going to be paid for you. I mean, they're looking at that kind of top-line stuff, mm -hmm. which may or may not be true, but that's what's been sold to them, and they feel like, yeah, that that's probably a more comfortable life. Because remember, to most people, the meaning of life is I want to be happy, I want to be comfortable, I want to be secure. And if you have a system of governance that says, we can provide those things for you, just let us make all your decisions, 
they see it as a win-win. They see it, yeah. I, I can see how they would. When you mentioned the, uh, the decline of the number of people that uh, really had that Christian worldview from the mid-90s until now, do you see, uh, uh, this would be tough to, tough to answer, I guess, but the uh, decline also in Bible knowledge of Christians? I mean, you get people identifying as Christians going to church, but do you see their Bible knowledge actually declining along with that worldview? Yeah, and, and you know, there are a number of different ways of measuring that. One is straight out asking them what they believe and why they believe it, and we do that. And yes, there's been a, a definitive decline in fundamental knowledge of biblical principles. Another way of looking at it, though, because you do what you believe, is to start looking at, at people's behavior, because that will let you know what they really believe. You're not going to do things that conflict with what you believe is proper. And so when we look at people's behavior, we've been measuring that for quite a while too, we're seeing that even simple things such as lying, stealing, cheating, uh, adultery, sex without marriage, all of these kinds of things, more and more Americans now believe that those are, in their minds, moral behaviors. Moral meaning that it's mm -hmm. right, not wrong. It's okay. And so, yeah, I mean, there's a dramatic shift taking place in America. Why? Families have given up the moral teaching of their children. They've handed it off to what they think are the paid professionals who will do it best, meaning school and government. Now, church should be in there, but churches by and large have abandoned moral teaching of children. They've abandoned worldview development with children. And so what we've done is we've effectively handed over the last two generations of children to in secular schools. institutions and individuals and said, here, you know what you're doing, do your thing, and boy, have they. Wow. And we have, just, we have just abdicated our responsibility to educate our children. We're we old. have. Yeah. Yeah. What, can, what, what, what can the church do? I mean, at this point, uh, can a strong Christian leaders, can they, can, they, can they bring about some substantial change in, in what's going on in the churches if they, they need a, a new mindset about what, what success is? But uh, do we need stronger leaders in church, stronger teachers and preachers, or just speakers? What, 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 what can the church do right now in providing that well, change? Well, it's an interesting thing you bring up because uh, we've done a lot of research on leadership. And one of the things we discovered from talking with the senior pastors of Christian churches across the country mm -hmm. is that most of them will tell you that they do not believe that God has called them to be leaders. They believe that God has called and gifted them to be teachers or preachers. And that's great. We need that. But there's a massive difference between being a teacher and a leader. And so what we need in the church today are leaders. You look at what's going on with the government shutting down churches across the country. Yeah. This is the time when church leaders should be standing up and leading a revolt of Christians saying not only is it unconstitutional, we as Christian individuals are not going to stand for you shutting down our ability to worship our God, to share the great things he's done in our lives with each other through prayer through conversation, through study together, all of these kinds of things. We need our leaders doing it. Where are these people? Where are these people? And so, yeah, I would say we need a lot more of the leaders that God has made to be able to step up today and use their leadership gifts, skills, and competencies to create the kind of positive change that we need. At the same time, we need those individuals who have been called and gifted as teachers not to teach the stuff that tickles people's ears, but to be teaching the hard truths of Jesus. Jesus said, you're my disciple when you do three things. In, in uh, John 8, he said, when you obey my teaching. In John 13, he said, you're my disciples when you love one another. John 15, he said, you're my disciples when you produce much fruit. So those are the things that we should be measuring. Those are the things that we should be teaching toward so that we're creating disciples who then take the Great Commission seriously and recognize that each of us has been called to go out into that secularized world and be creating disciples based on what's been given to us. It's, it seems like, and I don't want to condemn everybody, but it seems like there's, there's pastors who are more comfortable with casting a vision of brick and mortar or new events or something like that than they are casting a vision of growing this, con this congregation spiritually. It just seems like they've lost some of that first love. Well, you know, we, we've made 
the church experience all about church growth rather than about spiritual growth, about life transformation. Mm -hmm. That's why Jesus died on the cross, was so that we could be so transformed in our thinking. You know, the whole Romans 12, 1 and 2 passage about let God change the way that you think, you know, transform your mind. That's what we're supposed to be doing so that we can be more Christ-like and we can be salt and light in this culture. You can't be salt and light if you haven't been transformed by Christ. Right. I, I hesitate to close out and ask this question, <laughs> but given what you know and, you, and, and you've been researching this for, for years and given where we, we see ourselves right now in, the, in, this, in this country and also in the world, but especially in, in the United States, uh, can it be turned? Can the tide be turned uh, with what we do? Or do you see God, is it possible that God would turn that tide for a time uh, to give us... Well, well God us turns effort? things through people. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we, we have to take up the responsibility to do this with his guidance, his power. But, yes, it, it can be turned around with a couple of, of thoughts related to that. Number one, it cannot be turned around overnight. Because when you talk about how people make their decisions. It's about their worldview. Their worldview takes time to develop. It takes a lot of persistence and diligence on the part of parents and pastors and, and hopefully Christian teachers uh, building into the lives of young people. So that's a multi-generation process. In the interim, we have to remember that God changes cultures all the time. And he almost always does it through a remnant of people. He never waits till he has a majority of the population to do what he chooses to do in a particular culture. So this remnant can be turned around by the strength and the determination and the godliness of that remnant of people who know, love, and serve God with all their heart, mind, strength, and soul. And so it's on that remnant that we can turn it around. But we have to be very intentional and strategic about it. Not only can you watch Viewpoint each week, but you can also listen to it on demand as a podcast. You can go to WTLW.com and under videos, click Viewpoint, and you'll see the selection of interviews. You can also subscribe by searching for Viewpoint with Bob Placey on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. And remember to share the podcast with your friends. You can find out more about the research that comes out monthly from the Barner Group by going to barner.com. The purpose of Viewpoint is to share different opinions about how Jesus Christ and the Bible is relevant to our lives today. I hope wherever you are, you know that you're not a lost cause in God's eyes, and He does have a purpose and a plan for your life. For more, go to WTLW.com. You're going to find more information about how Jesus Christ can bring you the peace you've been looking for. I'm Bob Placey. Thanks for joining me. Remember, you can watch the interviews you've seen today on demand on YouTube. Plus, you can also listen to all of our episodes on the Viewpoint with Bob Placey podcast on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to a podcast.